turn this thing off. Well, last time Bryce and I said that we were bringing in a ringer to preach, there may have been some of you that thought, sure, mm -hmm, whatever, and then he came, and Tim McAlpine spoke, and you were like, oh, he was a ringer. Uh, well, guess what? We're doing it again. Next Sunday, uh, a week from today, Stephen Bray will be here. Those of you who are here uh, for our uh, Go With the Gospel conference in 2019, you will have heard him preach that Sunday morning. I'm still getting comments about that sermon, about how it impacted lives. He's going to preach to us from John chapter 9 next Sunday. And so we look forward to that, and you'll get some good preaching. So look forward to that. So today, we're going to be at the end of John chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, go there. As you're turning there, I, I got to think of because in this text that we're about to read, we have questions that are asked. And there's a lot of people who seem to have way too much time on their hands who concoct the most useless questions. And so I was, if you go to that bastion of all truth, Google, I'm kidding, and you type in, you know, funny or weird questions that people have, you, there is sites upon sites, pages upon pages of weird questions people ask. Here's a few of them. What happens if you get scared half to death twice? What's another word for a thesaurus? Good question. If vegetarians eat vegetables, what do humanitarians eat? Why doesn't glue stick to its container? Think about that. I've actually wondered that myself. Why is it that no matter what color the bubble bath you use, the bubbles themselves are always white? On and on we go. That's about the level of intelligence of the questions that the Jews are about to ask Jesus. And we will see that here. So go with me to John 8, starting at verse 48, and we're going to read to the end of the chapter. Here's what we read. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. That is the reading of God's word for this morning. Let's look at this text. Let's, we're going to unpack it in this way. That we're going to look at the three primary questions that the Jews asked to Jesus. And we will look then at answers to them. The first question they ask is, Are you, aren't you a demon-possessed Samaritan? Right? That's right off the hop there in verse 48. That's what they ask him. And his answer to them is this, keep my word and live. It doesn't seem like a, an answer that squares with their question, but that's what he says. So this here is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus is accused of being a Samaritan. This was akin to spitting on Jesus. If you go back to John chapter 4, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I un we, we looked at this uh, when we went through John 4 and Jesus' account with the woman of Samaria at the well. So if you want to look at what the Samaritans were and how they were viewed by the Jews, you can go back to that sermon. It's on YouTube. You can look at it there. 
But suffice to say that the Jews hated the Samaritans. They were, quote-unquote, a half-breed. And so they viewed them with derision and despised them. And this is probably coming out of Jesus' uh, statement to them that they are not essentially true descendants of Abraham. Go back to chapter uh, 8, uh, like the text before this, 39 and 40. They answered, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. So he's accusing them of not being Abraham's true children. And actually, if you go to the next verse, verse 41, you are doing the works your father did. They said, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Why would they say that? Well, Pastor Bryce did a good job of articulating that last week. I would, I would say, you know, could it be that by this point, word has spread that Mary was the mother of Jesus, but Joseph may not have been his father, biologically. So who was the dad? Remember, his brothers, back in Luke, we read that his brothers weren't believers in him at this point yet. Could it be that they're spreading word that he's only our half-brother? Maybe he's a Samaritan. He's a half-breed. So they call him a Samaritan, which is clearly meant to be a dig at Jesus. And they say, you are demon-possessed. You have a demon. Now, Jesus is referred to as having a demon many times. John 7, John 10. We're going to see these uh, coming up more throughout the Gospels. Jesus is accused of having a demon. You know you are in a position of feeling defeated when you lower yourself to name-calling. Make no mistake, for the believer who's going to follow Christ, we will face faulty accusations and we will face derision amongst those who don't know the Lord. This is what Jesus has said. This is what the Lord has said throughout the Word of God that the believer in Christ will face persecution. The one who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution. That's what Paul said to Timothy. They did this to Jesus, and if we are followers of Jesus, we should expect this. How did Jesus respond? First, uh, Peter 2, verse 23, it says there that there was no reviling in return from his mouth. While he was accused, while he was reviled, he did not revile in response or in return. As followers of Christ, this should be seen in us. Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes, at the end of that, he says, blessed, or the word for blessed there can be translated happy, are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake. Now, if you're being persecuted because you're being a jerk, that's on you. But if you're being persecuted because you are standing firm in Christ, with love and sincerity and genuineness of heart, but standing on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're being accused of all kinds of faulty things, blessed are you. So they persecuted your master, the prophets, and you will one day receive a great inheritance in heaven. So let us expect it. And let us rejoice when it comes, because he's counted us worthy to suffer persecution for his name's sake. But here he is being accused of these things, and how does he respond? What is his answer? Well, they're dishonoring the Lord by calling him demon-possessed. Because they're looking at his work, they're looking at his teaching, they're looking at all that Jesus has done, and they say, you must have a demon in you. You know what that is? That is the clinical definition, essentially, of the un pardonable sin. Look at Mark chapter 3, if you will. Keep your finger here. Go to Mark 3. Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 22. Here's what we read. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. Does that sound familiar to what we just read in John 8? Right? So, He called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, 
he cannot stand but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. He was guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. When you attribute to God the work of Satan, when you say you, are, you claim to be God, but you're actually doing this in the power of Satan, your heart is so hard. You're so opposed to Christ. It appears that there's no forgiveness for you. And this is what they were doing. What has Jesus been doing? He's keeping the word of God and the will of God perfectly. What does he say to them? He says, anyone who hears my word and instead of attributing it to Satan, actually obeys it, heeds it, he will never die, but actually will live. He's speaking here, of course, of eternal life. Now, every believer in here, unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, every believer here will taste the first death. Everyone. But what he's speaking of here is the second death. All those who are in Christ will not taste the second death. Second death is reserved for those who are unrepentant, unwilling to love Jesus, who are unwilling to bow their knee before the Savior. This morning in adult Sunday school, one of the texts we look at was uh, Revelation 21. Verses 6 to 8, and there it says this. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Do you see that there? To the one who has drunk from the waters of life, that is Jesus I will be his God, and he will be to me his son. They'll be in the presence of God forever. Praise God. But then look at verse 8. And as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So all those who are unrepentant, desiring to stay in their sin, hard of heart, opposed to Christ, they will face the second death. But he says here, anyone who keeps my word, anyone who lives in obedience to me because he loves me, he will live. Keep my word and live. Notice that obedience is required. It doesn't say believe my word. It says keeps my word. The proof that you believe the word of God is that you keep the word of God. Anyone can say, I believe it. It's the true believer who keeps it. And anyone who keeps my word will live. Jonathan Edwards said this, Tis not God's design that men should obtain assurance in any other way than by mortifying corruption and increasing in grace and obtaining the lively exercises of it. And although self-examination be a duty of great use and importance, and by no means should be neglected, that it is not the principal means by which saints do get satisfaction of their good estate. Assurance of our salvation is not to be obtained so much by self-examination as by action. We are assured of our salvation when we keep his word. And he said, the one who keeps my word will live. So the one who's been regenerated and justified, will give evidence of that and how they live their life. That's it. And that brings joyous hope. Now, you might say, well, I didn't keep his word perfectly over here. I didn't, I didn't keep his word exactly yesterday. Oh. Listen, none of you are perfect. I, don't, I hate to burst your bubble. You're going to struggle. But the one whose desire and goal and treasure in life is to keep the Word of God, yes, imperfectly, but desiring to do so with, with greater perfection, with greater clarity, with greater hope and joy, that person has assurance of salvation. They live with hope. 
in this world. Keep my word and live, Jesus says. There was a third century man who was anticipating his death, and he penned these words. Quote, it's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and they are persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome this world. These people are Christians, and I am one of them. There is joy in living in Christ, a hope that can't be taken from us. So his answer to them is, you call me demon-possessed and a Samaritan, you would just believe in me and put your hope in me and follow me, you could live. As you can imagine, that didn't sit well. Look at their second question now. Verse 52. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. So they just press on. Jesus has stripped away their argument, and yet they just keep going. We know you got a demon. Abraham died. As did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? In other words, who do you think you are? What is his answer? He is one who knows and is glorified by the Father. Look at his answer here. They're, of course, taking what Jesus said literally. If you keep my word, you will live and never die. And they're saying, well, what about Abraham? He's dead. They're thinking in the physical, earthly, here and now realm. They are not thinking in the spiritual realm at all. Their minds are so earthly that they're no heavenly good. And so they come and they say, who do you think you are? You're making yourself out to be greater than Abraham. John MacArthur puts it this way. Their question has an abusive overtone to it. They were certain that only someone with a demon could make it such an outlandish claim. But what does he say? I've been, I'm glorified by my Father. You see, Jesus had a very contented understanding of how the Father loved him who he was in relation to the Father. In John 17, in the high priestly prayer, in verse 24, this is what Jesus said in praying to the Father. He says this, Father, I desire that they also whom you've given to me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me before, uh, pardon me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, Jesus was the all-glorious one while he was on earth. He was the all-glorious one. Today, he's the all-glorious one. And one day, all the believers will stand in his presence and will see that he is the all-glorious one. We will all see his glory. He wasn't concerned about the accusations of this rabble. He wasn't concerned at all. He just drills deeper into the issue. I know my father, but you don't. They, They say God is our father, but he goes, no, he's not. You think God is your father? You don't know him. But I do. I know him. You don't. In fact, go to verse 55. In your small groups, there's, by the way, all those who are in small groups, we have about 60 people in small groups this year, which is great. All those who who are in small groups should be sitting here as theologians now because you've studied this passage all week, and you should be ready to go, I don't know if he's being accurate here. You should should all be like right on top of this passage. Hopefully, Hopefully I am being accurate. But you've all studied this. Look at verse 55. Four uses of the word know or known in the ESV. But they're not all the same Greek word. Ver, the first known. So, but Verse 55. But you have not known him. That is the Greek word gnosko. That is... The word know with a negative connotation. It means to come to know, to recognize, to be acquainted with in the negative. So how it's translated here is very accurate. 
You don't know him. You're not acquainted with him. You don't have a hot clue who he is. That would be the Martin's translation. You don't know God. And they would have understood that word, that Greek word. They would have understood that very well. But he is saying here, you don't know him. But then the next three uses of the word know are all the same Greek word, oida. So it has the same essential meaning except in the positive. So it literally means to be acquainted with, to have a knowledge, to understand in the positive. So Jesus says, you haven't known him. You don't know who he is, but I do know him. I am well acquainted with him. I have a perfect understanding of who God is. And then he goes, if I said I didn't know him, I'd actually be a liar like you guys are. Oh, this is, like Bryce said last week, this is so not a seeker-friendly sermon. He just lays it on the line. You're liars. You say you know God. You say God is your Father. You don't know Him. I know Him. And He knows me. Brothers and sisters, that's what we should aspire to. To know God. And to be known by God. You can have all the knowledge in the world about every other thing. If you don't know God, you're on a trajectory for hell. You must know Him. That is in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that Annalisa read to us earlier. Those are famous verses. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. You know what that word acknowledge means in Hebrew? No. In everything of our life, in all your ways, know him. In every possible way, seek to know him. That was the, the heart of the Apostle Paul. Go to Philippians chapter 3 for a moment. So, you remember Paul's story? Paul was a guy who was bent on killing Christians for a hobby. He was wicked. He was evil. He was trying to run the church out of town. And anyone who followed Jesus, get rid of them, drag them out of their house, persecute them, put them in jail, kill them if need be, get rid of them. And then in Acts chapter 9, the Lord in his mercy knocks Paul off his donkey. And he makes himself known to him. He reveals himself to Paul. And Paul spends the rest of his life seeking to minister the gospel to everyone and listen to his heart when he's recounting what his life used to be, and what his life is now in Philippians chapter 3. Listen to this. I'm actually going to back up and uh, go to verse uh, 4. Listen to this. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So He's giving them the, you know, here's what I was. In terms of the eyes of the Jewish people, in the eyes of the religious elite of the day, I was the man. But, he says in verse 7, Whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. See that? Let me back up. Because of the surpassing worth of what? Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now listen to verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That I may know him. His whole life is built on this. I want to know him. 
I want to know him more and greater and deeper because that is life. You can know all the mysteries of this world. You can know religion like the back of your hand if you don't know the God of creation, God who saved you. All of that is rubbish. Knowledge in our world is increasing at a rate that is hard to fathom. Thousands of pages per minute of new knowledge is surfacing. Einstein himself could not keep up. In fact, if you read for 24 hours per day from age 21 to age 70, at the rate of the increase of knowledge, you would be multiple millions of years behind. And yet all of the world's knowledge means upkiss. It means nothing if you don't know the Lord God Almighty. You must know Him or all is lost for you. But if you do know Him, praise God, and don't be content with the knowledge you have Grow in knowledge. Be like Paul to say, I want to know him. Some might look at, by the time he's writing Philippians, believers would have been right to say, well, Paul, don't you already know him? And he's saying, I want to know him more. I want to know him deeper. So it should be for all of us. We would know him all the more. One more question that they ask him back in John chapter 8. The question is this. You have seen Abraham? what they say. This is verse 57. You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Why are they asking that question? They're asking the question because of the bomb that Jesus dropped right before that. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it, past tense, and was glad. And they said, uh, excuse me, what did you just say? See, his answer, as we're going to see, is before Abraham was, I am. We're going to get to that statement in a moment. But here they're triggered. You said what? What is he meaning by this? What is he meaning by what he says in verse 56? Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it. And was glad. Well, let's look at it this way. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. God is speaking to Abraham and is giving him a covenant. And in that covenant, in verse 3, we read this. This is the, the covenant that God makes with Abraham. I will bless those that bl- who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And listen to this. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice what it does not say. In you, all the Jews will be blessed. It doesn't say that. It says, in you, all the families of the earth, Jew and Gentile, all families will be blessed. How is that going to happen through Abraham? Through his offspring. There will come one through whom Jew and Gentile can experience the full blessing of God. There is going to be coming a descendant of Abraham that will bless the entire world. Now, we know in this text, this is why context matters. Remember, the, the Jews are the ones who brought Abraham up. Why did they bring him up? Because Jesus earlier, in verse 51, I believe it is, yes, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And they said, well, Abraham's dead. He said, let's talk about Abraham. Is Abraham dead? He just said, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. So is Abraham dead? I say to you, no. They weren't getting that. But go with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, what does it say here in verses 37 and 38? 
but, the de- but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. In the passage about the bush, we're going to come to that in a moment. Where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. What does he say there? He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God is not a God of those who are dead. So what does that tell us about Abraham? If God's not the God of the dead, Abraham is alive. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Hebrews 11, verse 13, here's what we read. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They greeted them from afar. Now in Genesis 15, verse 6, we read that Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed it was counted to him as righteousness, and he is alive. Abraham rejoiced that he would see the day of the Lord, and he saw it, meaning that the saints of old were up in glory and the Messiah came to earth and they rejoiced. And this is blowing the circuits of these Jews. You're not even 50, because they're not thinking in that realm. You're not even 50 years old. You're 30-something years old. And you say you've seen Abraham, and now Jesus drops the hammer. Ready for it? Look at 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's not a grammatical error. You see, spiritual things are only comprehended by those whom the Spirit has opened their eyes. Right? 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that. Those who are earthly cannot see spiritual things, and these folks couldn't see it. And here he is dropping the hammer to say, for Abraham was, I am. What is he saying? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Keep your finger here. Go with me to Exodus 3. This is, of course, Moses before the burning bush. Moses, of course, was being called by God to go and be the agent through whom he would bring freedom to the people. He The Lord has heard their cry. They've been under this bondage of Pharaoh for 400 years. He's heard their outcry, and he is sending Moses to be the deliverer for them. And Moses is giving all kinds of excuses. I'm not good enough for that. I I don't send send someone else. I can't speak very good. Try send someone else. One of the questions that Moses asks God is, well, if I go and tell them to let the people go, who shall I say is sending me? Look at, look at here, chapter 3, starting at verse 13. Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That should make you read John 8, 58 with shivers. Because that's exactly what Jesus is saying. And if you think, well, is he really, was he really saying that? Maybe that was a slip of the tongue. We know that's exactly what he was saying by their reaction. Look at 59. They picked up stones to kill him instantly. They knew what he was saying. He was making a claim Deity, I am that God who spoke to Moses. Who was in the burning bush? Jesus. Isn't this stunning? In Genesis chapter 1, who's creating the Trinity? Because we read in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our image. Who's us? Father. Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus was there at creation. In fact, go with me to Colossians chapter 1. 
If you're going to be the God who is there at creation, what does that tell you? If you're the one who's doing the creating, that tells us something. It tells us that you were there before creation. You can't be the God who creates it all if you weren't there before it was created. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He, so this is speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is the great I am. Jesus is saying, I am that God, the only God, that God that spoke to Moses, that was me. The God that created it all, that was me. The one who set the plan of salvation in place, that was the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, before the world was created. That was me. Why does that matter to us? It matters because this should give us, among other things, great comfort. Your salvation does not rest upon a recent Savior. Your salvation does not rest upon a recent religion. Unlike the Mormons who were founded in 1830 by Joseph Smith, or the Jehovah's Witnesses that were founded by Charles Taze Russell in 1870, or even those of Islam founded by Muhammad around 610 A.D., Christianity has a foundation that has not got a time limit. There's no calendar on when it started. From before time began, Jesus was the Savior. So our salvation is built on the one, according to Revelation 1, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the eternal one. So that means that what Hebrews 7, verse 25 says is accurate, that he is able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to him. So if you're a believer here, rejoice. Your salvation is not on shaky ground. Before time began, the I am was the Savior. He was God. Jesus didn't begin in Matthew chapter 1. Jesus didn't begin in Genesis chapter 1. He never began. He's eternal. And he will be without end. The Alpha and the Omega. I was reminded of a true story of John Sargent, a famous American painter who once painted a, a panel of roses, and it was praised by even his worst critic. It was considered borderline perfection in terms of art. He was offered multiple millions of dollars for it many times. He refused to sell it. He considered it his best work. He was quite proud of it. And whenever he would be deeply discouraged or doubtful in a difficult state of mind, he would look at that painting. And when he looked at it, he would say to himself, I painted that. And by looking to it, it would restore his confidence. Brothers and sisters, don't look at the world. Don't look at people in the world. Don't even look to your people you even admire, preachers, the teachers, the elders, your, your neighbors, people sitting next to you in the chairs right now. Don't look to them for your hope. Boy, I tell you, you look to Christ. You look to the one who is the great I am. You look to the one who spoke to Moses in that burning bush. You look to the one who created it all, the one who was there before the beginning, the one who has no end at the end. You look to him and the confidence of your faith should be restored. If you're feeling shaky in your faith. You feel like you might be wavering. Look to Christ. Look to the one who is the great I am. And have your confidence restored. Because he is the great I am. Your salvation is secure. Because he is the great I am. Your savior will never leave. Because he is the great I am. We live today with hope. 
Father, I pray that we would live with such confidence. Thank you that you are eternal. We are so finite, and yet you are infinite. Your salvation that has been purchased on our behalf was planned from eternity past. This is the testimony of your word. And we pray that our faith might not waver. And Lord, if it does, we pray that you would remind us that the great I am purchased our salvation with his own blood. Because of that, we have hope. So, Father, lead us on in that. May we not, like the Jews, cast aspersions upon Jesus. May we not cast stones at him, but rather may we trust him. We trust our Savior. Give us confidence, we pray, that we may go and live for your glory and whatever accusations may come our way, that we would deal with them with the grace of Christ, with the courage of Christ. Lead us on in these things, we pray in Jesus' name.